The current focus on reproducibility in science can in many ways be traced back to an article written by Glenn Begley and Lee Ellis that was published in the journal Nature in March of 2012. I didn't start out with the intention of stepping into this mess. What I started out to do was, when I was at Amgen, was to prepare for my successor. So one of the things that we did early on was create project reviews. The ability of his group to reproduce um, 53 seminal studies in cancer, they were only able to reproduce the seminal findings, that's the important point, not every data point, and you don't decrease tumor growth by exactly the same amount, you know, in every study, but the seminal findings should be reproducible, and his group was only able to reproduce it in six out of 53 studies. When Begley and Ellis did their study, it was sort of in the 15 to 20 percent range of reproducibility, and then subsequent other studies that have been done that are sort of in the 20 to 25 percent reproducibility overall. And these sorts of studies suggest that that's sort of where we are at the reproducibility issue or somewhere between at best half of the studies are reproducible and maybe less than 25 percent. What causes that lack of reproducibility isn't really so well defined and it probably represents a lot of factors. In a paper published in PLOS Biology in June of 2015, Len Friedman and colleagues attempted to identify the potential sources of irreproducibility in the life sciences and associate a dollar figure to each source. You know, in conversations we talk about what the financial impact of this would be, what the economic impact of this would be. And in one of our initial events, we decided to try to do an analysis for irreproducibility. We calculated the amount of spending which is publicly available on both clinical and preclinical research and divided that by a 50% irreproducibility rate and we came up with this $28 billion value. Needless to say, that definitely um, rustled some jimmies, if you will. In his paper, Friedman outlines four areas that can contribute to issues with a study's reproducibility. These include laboratory protocols, data analysis and reporting, study design, and biological reagents and reference materials. This last category itself is made up of several different types of reagents, including animal models, cell lines, antibodies, and other reagents. Our focus will be on antibodies. Informal conversations I've had with people like Glenn Begley, he will tell you that a big source of the inability to replicate the papers that they tried to replicate were one way or another the source of the antibodies. We were interested in trying to develop a diagnostic test for melanoma and the idea is that our diagnostic test would detect those patients that were likely to have their melanoma recur. We built and did a training set and a validation set and showed that we could tell whether a patient had about a 7 or 10 percent chance of recurrence versus a 40 or 50 percent chance of recurrence just on the basis of these tests and we published that back in 2009 and then we subsequently got a second R01 to validate the test and begin to prospectively test it in the commercial setting or in the clinical setting. The key reagents in the test were five different antibodies and of the five antibodies two of them were completely non-reproducible. That is, we bought a lot of antibody that had the same number from the same vendor. We never published a follow-up paper because we couldn't reproduce the signature and thus couldn't reproduce the clinical test. The problem that the RIM lab faced was most likely the result of antibodies that had not been properly validated. The issue of antibody validation is currently an area of great focus for the companies that manufacture and distribute antibodies to the research community. During the 1980s and early 1990s, antibodies were primarily generated by academic research labs. This meant that the creation of a new antibody was both time and labor intensive, and the number of antibodies to any given antigen was limited. The 1990s saw a growth in the number of antibody suppliers, fueled in part by the Human Genome Project. As new genes were identified, tools to work with those gene products became necessary. The use of antibodies in the research labs expanded dramatically. A search on PubMed for publications containing the term Western blot in 1990 yields 2,949 results. By the end of the decade, that number had more than doubled, and by 2015, there are almost 10 times the number of Western blot publications in PubMed than there were in 1990. A similar analysis for other antibody-based techniques yields similar results. Before the Human Genome Project, if there was several thousand antibodies, maybe five, 10,000 antibodies, and literally within the course of 10 to 15 years, 
you had hundreds of thousands, if not millions of new antibodies entering into the market. And so I think what that's done is it's created an accelerated need to validate those antibodies better. And in order to really validate an antibody, you have to understand the biology of the target. When we talk about validating an antibody, what we're really talking about are three properties. The first property is sensitivity, or the ability of the antibody to recognize the intended target. The second property is antibody specificity, the ability of the antibody not to recognize things that it should not, in fact, recognize. And the third property, which is equally as important, is reproducibility. We should be able to demonstrate to the end user that there is reproducibility, not only as you repeat a specific experiment, but on a lot-to-lot -lot basis.